Hello and welcome to the First and Ten Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Feltz. I'm here in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, we're recording our week two episode today. Uh, we're getting into week two games. Got a full slate this week. And joining me, as always, is Reed Murray in Nashville. What's going on, Reed? Um, I'm feeling a little spooked, honestly. We got uh, Ohio State, Penn State on Halloween Day away. It's not going to be a whiteout crowd. Still feels uh, a little too spooky for me, but hopefully Ohio State will be able to overcome all that and i'm really excited to get into the rest of these week two games absolutely and uh joining us our special guest for the first time our first international guest it's 10 hours ahead so right now it's 10 o'clock over in sweden it's our first time guest kevin narcissi aka nar how are you doing today hey patrick and reed great thanks for having me yeah i um uh, first international guest, so I feel very important. Thank you. I also feel very old because it's getting late and because I went to school. I went to college with Reed's dad. So, <laughs> Right, yeah. Uh, so first time guest here, and we're going to talk about all the week two games uh, here in a moment. But uh, Reed, Nara, anything from you guys before we get started? Um. We're going to get into this later, but uh, Ohio State Penn State week is always um, a special week, especially when you hear the story we got about NAR last time. Uh, I believe last time you saw an Ohio State Penn State game in person uh, in Columbus. But uh, make sure you stay for the rest of the episode for Ohio State Penn State preview and all the uh, fun commentary that's going to come with it. Yeah, I didn't see the whole game in person, but that's part of the story. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we'll get to that. I'm sure that'll be the final game we talk about the the kind of cap on this episode but let's get it started with the friday night matchup uh so 7 30 p.m on friday night uh the man the maryland terrapins hosting the minnesota golden gophers on espn maryland call, coming up a huge loss 43 to 3 the hands of northwestern minnesota coming off saturday night football loss 49 24 to michigan so both teams coming off a loss one team looked much worse than the other, though. I think this is a pretty easy one to call in favor of Minnesota. Yeah, I think Minnesota really needs to bounce back after that embarrassing loss at home to Michigan. I mean, I didn't see that one coming at all. As much as Michigan is a respectable program, uh, they really handed Minnesota's asses to them. And this seems like the perfect game for Minnesota to bounce back against Maryland, who's arguably the worst team in the Big Ten. Neither of them are Michigan State, I would say. Um, one thing I'll be on the lookout for this week is the gopher defense struggled last week a lot against this Michigan offense that had a new quarterback, a lot of young players. They gave up 225 passing yards and 481 total yards to an offense. Like I said, first time, first time starting quarterback. And I'm really curious to see how they do against another first time starting quarterback in Tolia Tagovailoa at Maryland. Right. And you know, with this game, this is a Maryland team that last week gave up 43 points to an offense that last season was absolutely anemic in Northwestern. So, you know, going into this week, can this be Minnesota's bounce back game defensively? Maybe, you know, give up 10 or less points. I think that's kind of going to be the goal for them uh, because Maryland looked really, really bad last week. You know, three interceptions for Tagovailo in his first start. And, and if the Minnesota offense, you know, aside from, uh, you know, the run game, which looked great, passing game struggled. And that was because everybody was just doubling Rashad Bateman. So maybe Bateman can kind of have a bounce back game here. And same with Tanner Morgan. Expecting a big bounce back from the Gophers, so I've got him 45-10. Yeah, I've got a similar score, and um, it seems like the key to stopping Minnesota is locking up Rashad Bateman, which I don't think Maryland will be able to do. So I got the Gophers big. I'm going Minnesota 45, Maryland 21. I'm going with a similar score, and, you know, Minnesota came in to the season, I think for the first time in a long, long time, with something called expectations. And – um, Michigan, I didn't get to catch the game because it was middle of the night here, but Michigan really handed it to them last week from everything I could see. I did watch the uh, extended replay. Um, on the other side, Maryland may be the worst team in the Big Ten. In fact, they're not, not maybe, they are the worst team in the Big Ten. Uh, very, very quickly, they became the worst team in the Big Ten. I've got Minnesota 45, Maryland 17. All right, similar scores across the board. Yeah, so uh, that's the first game. You can catch that one at 7.30 p.m. Friday night on ESPN. All right, let's get into the noon slate. So got two noon games this week, the first of which is going to be the big noon kickoff for the week. Michigan State heading to Michigan. Wolverines hosting 
the Spartans, Michigan State coming off of a historic loss to Rutgers, the Scarlet Knights' first conference win since 2017, 38-27 in East Lansing, and Michigan, again, coming off of that big win against Minnesota. Michigan's going to blow them out, and I'm not even sure it's really a, a question of if, but just how much are they going to beat them by. Yeah, I have my notes here. This will be the blowout to end all blowouts. This is going to be one of the worst games in this historic rivalry. And why is this game the big noon kickoff? I mean, I get that it's a historic rivalry, two big programs, but there's got to be something better on for Fox to choose. I mean, this is uh, who's going to want to watch this game after the first quarter. The only real reason to watch this one is if you're a Michigan fan or if you're curious as to how Joe Milton's going to look throughout the season. So um, really questionable call by Fox on that one. But um, this Michigan defense looks strong against Minnesota. This is a Minnesota team, like NAR said, they had expectations coming into the season, uh, had a really good quarterback. He was my Heisman sleeper. He no longer is. But um, they looked strong against Minnesota. A Sparty team who had seven turnovers against Rutgers, no way they moved the ball in Michigan. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. Uh, no, I'm, I'm going, I'm going 42-3 to three for Michigan here. Not even close. Yeah, Patrick, it uh, it could be that big. I've got Michigan big as well. Um, hating to do that being an Ohio State fan, but uh, it, it's reality. <laughs> uh, Michigan's more talented across the board. Um, Michigan State, I think, is going to struggle for a while. And I, I think as, as much as Mark D'Antonio did for that program, um, he really, really let that program slide the last few years. I think he got very complacent with his hires. Um, he was very complacent on the offensive end of the ball. Um, all he did was move some coaches around a few years ago. He just didn't make any major changes. And I think he actually left the program in pretty bad shape. Uh, and I hate to say that for a guy who really, really elevated it to uh, a, lo a national level that it's never, ever seen before. Um, but I, I think D'Antonio, I hate to say it, but I think he stayed three or four years too long. Uh, is what happened. And Mel Tucker, you hire Mel Tucker coming in. He's been a big name. Uh, he's an Ohio guy. He's from Cleveland. Uh, he was in the Ohio State program. He was in some big programs. Uh, he's coached in the pros. He was a huge name. Every big coaching job that would come up, Mel Tucker, Mel Tucker, Mel Tucker, that's all you heard. He goes to Colorado and goes five and seven. And that's his only coaching, head coaching year, uh, one, one year of experience. And you get what you hire. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Michigan State hires him, and um, they're they're in bad shape right now. I mean, they got beat by. I know Shiano's done a lot with Rutgers, and we'll talk about them in a bit. But he lost to lots to Rutgers and lost badly last week. I've got Michigan 38-13, but I might uh, if I'm going to lean one side, it could be worse. Uh, like Patrick said, it's 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 how bad it's going to be. Yeah, and I think on uh, Michigan's offensive side of the ball, I think Joe Milton is going to have a similar game to the one he had against Minnesota because neither of those defenses are too impressive. Minnesota, uh, their defense already wasn't that good last year. They lost some production. Uh, this year's Sparty defense is not the one we've seen in past years. So I think he moves the ball relatively well. I'm really more curious to see how Milton's going to perform uh, a few weeks down the road against Indiana and Wisconsin, two much better defenses. I've got Michigan uh, w even bigger than you guys had them. I got the Wolverines winning 59-3 to at home. Wow, wow, big. That would be a, almost a fireable offense for Michigan State losing, you know, by 56. I mean, you take State into rival. consideration how many points they put up on Minnesota, a better team across the board. They put 49 on them on the road. So, uh, and again, seven turnovers against Rutgers. Yeah, seriously. I think uh, this Michigan defense might have a field day in terms of interceptions. Mm -hmm. That game will be at noon on Fox. Uh, the other noon game, uh, this one probably going to be more competitive, but we'll see to what extent. Purdue taking on Illinois on BTN. Purdue coming off of a big, uh, you know, kind of last minute win over Iowa. Scrappy game, 24-20. And Illinois coming off of a blowout loss to Wisconsin. The Badgers are no longer playing. I think Purdue wins this, and I think Purdue wins this by two scores. I think they're just a better team, especially, you know, you're going to have Rondale Moore back this week. I haven't heard any word on if. Uh, Coach Jeff Brown will be back this week after getting COVID, but sounds like Rondell Moore is going to be in the lineup. And if they could beat Iowa without Rondell Moore, I think they can really beat Illinois with Rondell Moore. Yeah, I think Illinois, after their early week one loss against Wisconsin, I think they have a lot to prove going into this game, and I don't think they end up proving it. Um, going in, it seems like a game where this Illini offense may thrive against a shaky Boilermaker defense, but the problem is the Purdue D-line. Um, 
in a, in a situation where you have a quarterback, Brandon Peters, who's been kind of on and off, hot and cold through his entire Illinois career, I think a D-line as good as this one led by George Karloftis can really shake him up, and I think that's going to be good enough to compensate for the rest of the poor defense for Purdue. Um, I think Purdue wins this one pretty comfortably, 38-10, and I think if there was ever a game where Aiden O'Connell will shine at quarterback for Purdue, it's going to be this one because this is an Illini ID who coming into the season we thought was going to be pretty impressive. We thought their secondary was going to look good, but they clearly didn't against Wisconsin when they lost 45 to seven. So I think this might be the game for Aiden O'Connell to maybe build his confidence, uh, build up a stat sheet. And uh, I think Purdue wins comfortably. Yeah, I've got uh, Purdue winning as well. And, you know, Purdue the past three or four years, I think is behind only Iowa being uh, the most Jekyll Hyde team in the big 10. They seem to come out, they, you know, they slay a dragon or they play a great game and then they just come and, and just lay an egg. Um, you know, Iowa seems to do that a lot. So very unpredictable. I almost picked Illinois in an upset here. And, you know, Illinois, I'll talk about Maryland being the worst team in the Big Ten this year. Illinois, to me, is the biggest disappointment in the Big Ten in the last 25 years. They have no excuse to be as consistently bad as they are. They had a rebound year last year. OK, but, um, you know, they just they just need to be better for the Big Ten as a program. Uh, they've got some history. Uh, they've got the Midwest recruiting base. Uh, they just have no excuse to be as consistently bad as they are. Um, you know, in the end, I think Purdue pulls this out. I've got Purdue 31 20. Good pick. Yeah, I'll go. Uh, I'll go. Uh, I'll go 30 to 17 on Purdue. All right. That game will be on BTN at noon. Uh, let's get into, before we get into the 3.30 slate, uh, let's talk about the game that's not happening. Uh, this one was supposed to be a 3.30 FS1 game, uh, but now it is not going to be being played at all. Nebraska and Wisconsin off the table due to a COVID outbreak at Wisconsin. Uh, it started with quarterback Graham Mertz testing positive on Sunday, and it spiraled all the way to uh, head coach Paul Chris testing positive. So it sounds like the outbreak at Wisconsin is a little out of control. And uh, on Thursday, it was also reported that was that Nebraska was trying to schedule an out-of-conference game against UT Chattanooga, which was promptly shot down by the Big Ten. Uh, your thoughts on this? I think it's a pretty low move for Nebraska to try to schedule that game because the Big Ten has made it clear with their safety protocols and what they want to do with their schedule. No out-of-conference games. We're going to keep it all in the conference. And Nebraska – throughout this entire situation seems to be of the mindset that we do whatever we want. We're Nebraska. You can't tell us what to do. We can't be governed. Um, and they also are trying to go with this motto of everybody hates us. Everybody's out to get us. Um, they recently tweeted out that if this was us with a COVID outbreak, would the game be canceled if it was us as opposed to Wisconsin, which I think is just a really petty thing to tweet that I just, it was their official account too. This wasn't just some journalist or, um, a fan account and it was the uh, I think it was the Husker sports radio account oh it was oh I thought it yeah. was uh my bad on that one it was but, yeah, uh, still an official university account nonetheless yeah poor move it's yeah like you said it's an official university account and I, I just disagree with pretty much everything Nebraska has said this season when it comes to complaining about their schedule thinking that the Big Ten made it intentionally hard by scheduling both Ohio State and Penn State um and it's just, I, I just, I, I already didn't like Nebraska. I already didn't have very much respect for them. And this is just fuel to that fire. Right. Yeah. And, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. My bad. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Sorry. We got a little delay here. So sorry about that. Um, but yeah, the, the thing, I, I don't blame Nebraska for wanting to play. My concern with this is, and, and let me preface it with this, the, the 21 day layoff for players that test for COVID, you guys probably covered this in a previous podcast, is ridiculous. It's, it's too long. I think normal medical protocol is 10 days, maybe 14 tops if you want to be add some cushion to it like the Big Ten did. But that's, uh, that's a lot of cushion for 21 days. And, and you know, you're going to have Mertz out now out against Michigan. And, you know, what was lining up to be you know, you talk about Penn State, Ohio State being the game of the year. Penn State's lost a game. That could have been the game of the year in the Big Ten in three weeks, um, two weeks now, I think. Um, but that he's now out for Michigan. The 21-day protocol uh, for being out is, is brutal. But what, what I get concerned with with this situation is that there were 
there were no um, there were no limitations hit on the amount of players that was affected because they do a running total with this. So last week you had players that zero people were testing. So the running total by Saturday wouldn't have been above the threshold that the Big Ten cancels the games on, on based off of the Big Ten policies that they stated uh, a few weeks ago when they had, hey, here are the, here are the new COVID rules. So Wisconsin was still going to be below that percentage threshold, threshold from the way I understand it. What I think is happening here and could happen here is a very slippery slope where Wisconsin says, we're shutting down football. Um, we have too many players out. Or if you want to be really bad about it, you could just say that, hey, our top three quarterbacks are out. Our, our two of them have COVID and one of them has a foot injury. Uh, we'd have to play a four-string quarterback, and we've got a couple other players and coaches out, so we're just going to cancel football this week. And now we get to cancel and opt out of a game, and we get it classified as a no contest, not a uh, not a loss, uh, not a forfeit. So I think this opens up a bit of a slippery slope for the rest of the season for the Big Ten. Um, right. Who else wants to opt out when it's advantageous for them? Just go ahead and do it and take a no contest game. Slippery slope, in my opinion. Right. And, and the thing with that is, I think if you're going to cancel the game yourself, if you're Wisconsin, I think that's a good move on them canceling the game. You know, it probably sure. is not safe for them to play. Odds are the outbreak is going to worsen and they're probably going to have even more, you know, cases in the next couple of days. But if they're going to cancel that game themselves and not wait for the conference to tell them, let's not play, you know, if they are below the threshold and they've got enough healthy players and enough guys who aren't sick, then they should be playing until the conference tells them otherwise if they cancel it themselves. And that really should be a forfeit, I think. You know, if if they are technically good enough to play, if they've got the amount of guys the conference says you can have, if you don't have that testing limit, was it a safer move for them to not play and to, you know, to cancel the game themselves? Absolutely. I think that is probably the right move, but should it count as a loss? Kind of tough to say, but if the conference isn't going to go and cancel it themselves, then probably if Wisconsin is opting out of a game. And, you know, with Nebraska trying to play another game, I get it. I know they want to play, but I think they should have done that privately with the big 10 instead of, you know, coming out publicly and and causing a big, you know, ruckus about it. Like you don't need to be so showy about it. If you want to play a game, handle it privately and say, Hey, we want to play a game. The big 10 tells, you no. okay, whatever. Don't come out and cry about it. Like, I think that's, I don't think their intention was really ever to end up playing with UT Chattanooga. I'm sure they, if it was allowed, they would have done it. But the reason they were public about it, I think, is just to get people riled up and to feed into this uh, idea that the Big Ten doesn't like Nebraska, like I said, and because that's what they seem to be putting out everywhere. And I think when it comes to Wisconsin, when you talk about it being a no contest as opposed to a loss or a forfeit, I think the problem with counting games like these as losses is that it encourages teams to underreport or lie when it comes to the cases. Oh, you're right. Yeah, let's say Ohio tough. State, Michigan, Wisconsin, Penn State, all these big programs – Say they're 6-0, and oh, two weeks left in the season, starting quarterback gets COVID, uh, head coach gets COVID, something like that. Now they got to go play the last two games. They're 6-0. and oh, They could potentially be 6-2, and two, where if those players were healthy and they could play, they could be 8-0. and oh. And I think it could inc- that type of punishment situation would encourage teams to underreport and lie about their cases, which is overall the worst-case scenario. So I think um, you want to limit punishment in that way because – you want to promote honesty with, with this kind of thing. Um, so that's my stance when it comes to uh, forfeiting. And I didn't even think about that. that, Reed. That's, that's a really smart way of looking at it. Yeah. You don't want people to not report cases because that could just lead to a super dangerous uh, pattern from there. But, you know, from just like a broader football perspective, I get the whole count as a loss thing, but, you know, from a virus perspective of not reporting cases, that could, that could be just super dangerous. I think you're, you're right there. I'm with yeah, you have to be careful. All of a sudden, we'll be the SEC. Right, yeah, and I mean, Florida. <laughs> yeah. And, and you'd like to hope that – Yeah. You'd like to hope that teams would be honest with this kind of thing, even with that situation. But the fact of the matter is you can't even – you can't trust them. And uh, a big program like Ohio State or Penn State, you never know. Um, and they can be shady about these kind of things. So uh, you want to make sure that in, in, a, in every possible case, it's going to be as safe as possible. Yeah, so the, the Huskers and the Badgers are off this week. Uh, next week, Nebraska is scheduled to play Northwestern, so they'll be getting a bye before that game. And Wisconsin is still scheduled to take on Purdue, but it remains to be seen if that game will be played. 
So anyway, in the 3.30 slot on ESPN at 3.30, Northwestern, the Wildcats taking on Iowa. Iowa lost their opener at ross Aid Stadium against Purdue last week, 24-20, thanks to a David Bell touchdown in the final minutes. And Northwestern got it done 43-3 to against Maryland, an absolute blowout. This could be an ugly game. You know, the Northwestern offense was really bad last season, but they've looked great in their one game so far. And I still think that Northwestern defense is just better than the Iowa defense. I like Northwestern in this one, 27 to 20. Yeah, I got a similar pick. And I think the biggest storyline going into this game has to be that developing Northwestern offense facing their first uh, impressive defense of the year. And while the Hawkeyes didn't look great week one, they did force multiple turnovers against one of the better offenses in the Big Ten featuring, uh, of course, David Bell and Aiden O'Connell, who's not an elite quarterback by any means, but uh, he had a good year last year. Um, so Iowa, they still looked impressive, at least on the defensive side of the ball. So that's really something you got to look out for, this Northwestern offense, which is trending in the right direction, but it's hard to tell, really hard to gauge how good they are when they go against a really lackluster Terrapins defense. And I mainly want to watch for Isaiah Bowser because this is a Northwestern offense. The coordinator is really run oriented. So I want to see how he as a running back who hasn't really had a lot of success in his career. He looked good week one. I want to see how he's going to perform, like I said, against the, uh, their first impressive defense of the year. Um, and I'm really curious to see how Bowser is going to look when facing actual good opposition. I got Northwestern 21 to 20. I think this game is going to come down to the wire. Um, same score Iowa had last week with 20 points. Um, I just don't think their offense under Spencer Petrus can get it done against such an impressive Northwestern D. Yeah, I've, uh, this is the one I'll, I'll differ from you guys on a bit. And it, it is based on uh, not a lot because I've not seen either of these teams play. Um, I think the game is going to be ugly, as Patrick mentioned. In the Iowa, and Iowa is the king of ugly games. And I think they can win ugly games. And they're a bit Jekyll Hyde. I think Iowa bounces back. I've got Iowa 27-17 in an ugly game. All right. So uh, first descent in this game, uh, you can catch that one on ESPN at 3.30. Uh, should be a good one. Uh, you know, two teams I think are relatively evenly matched. I picked Northwestern to win the West in the preseason. And, you know, one weekend I'm still feeling confident about that. If they can pull it off against Iowa, I'm going to feel even more confident. All right. So uh, our second to last game of the week 3.30 p.m. This is on Fox Sports 1 now, formerly on BTN. Number 17, Indiana Hoosiers taking on the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. Indiana coming off of the upset win against Penn State, uh, 36-35 in Bloomington on the last second two-point conversion by Michael Penix Jr. And Rutgers coming off of their first Big Ten win since 2017, 38-27 against Michigan State. I'm taking Indiana here. You know, at first I got a little worried. You know, seeing Rutgers come off a win, I'm still taking Indiana, you know, 31-14. to 14. Uh, I think, you know, Rutgers looked way better. They looked improved. But the fact of the matter is Michigan State turned the ball over seven times, and yet they still had a chance to win this game late. I don't think that's going to happen against a much better Indiana team. You'd hope it doesn't happen against a much better Indiana team. This Michigan State team's awful. Indiana's not. You'd hope that doesn't happen against a really good IU team. And uh, even on the road, I think they can get it done against Rutgers. I'm saying 31-14, to 14, Indiana. Yeah, I've seen some talk about Rutgers not being the same team we've seen in the past, which is true. They actually got a Big Ten Conference win, which they haven't done since, I believe, 2017. So huge step in the right direction for them. And that's especially huge when it comes to a mental or psychological perspective um, to actually put a tally in the win column. But let's relax a little bit. It's still Michigan State. This is a Michigan State team who gave up seven turnovers in their first game of the year. And like I said, it's still week one. Um, so we haven't seen enough from this Rutgers team to really say if they can challenge a team like Indiana, who's now ranked in the top 25. Um, I don't think they'll be able to. I think their offense is looking much better than it has in the past. And uh, their defense, it looks all right, but it's still a Michigan State offense with Rocky Lombardi at quarterback. So forcing seven turnovers, while that is a big number, uh, um, an extremely impressive feat. So I'm not really feeling the Scarlet Knights hype. And I think this is going to be a great game for Michael Penix to really bounce back. I mean, he bounced back in the fourth quarter late in that Penn State game. But early on, he looked not his best. I think this is going to be a perfect game for him to regain his confidence going into the bigger games they have coming up on the schedule. So I have Indiana winning big 41-14 on the road. I think this, this one is close in the first quarter and into the second quarter. But I think at about halftime, Indiana really starts to pull away. 
Yeah, and you know, you talked about Penix a little bit. I think the thing with him is he did struggle for those first three quarters because he was a guy who hasn't played a game in a year. So, you know, he, he comes out in the fourth quarter of that last drive, just looks incredible. Same thing with overtime. You know, he basically wills the team to victory all by himself. So, you know, he comes into this next game, probably going to look way better, you know, just judging off the end of that game. Looks like he shook off the rust. Yeah, I've got, um, I've got Indiana winning. Uh, I've got it a little closer, 34-31. Um, I have my thoughts on Greg Schiano as a defensive coordinator, being an Ohio State fan. However, he's done a very nice job in a very short time at Rutgers. I mean, just to make them competitive from where they were uh, the past few years is a, is a feat. Um, he did a really nice job in transfer. He went and brought kids in. Uh, I think there's, I don't know, there were 35 or 40 new kids in that program. Um, he's got him competitive. You got to give him credit. I know it was Michigan State, but uh, that's, that's a game before where Rutgers gets beat by 30 points. Um, I've got IU winning, and this is, I'm going to call this the who can handle successful because IU is coming off a big upset of uh, Penn State. Rutgers has their first Big Ten win in several years. So who can say, handle success in week two? I've got IU winning in a closer one than you guys think, 34-31. Yeah, knowing Indiana football, it wouldn't surprise me um, if they almost let this one slip away because uh, they're not a team who handles success super well. But I think – I think they got enough to get it done. Like I said, I'm not really buying all the Rutgers hype. And while it is impressive that they've even got a win, um, I don't see that. I think this is a much better Indiana team than the one we've seen in the past. And uh, I got Indiana big still. Yeah, you got to keep in mind, it's still Indiana football. Anything is possible. I've been watching this team, you know, forever. So <laughs> I've seen the lows and the even lowers. But, you know, this team's riding a high it's really never seen before. So uh, we'll see how they react. And hopefully it's good going to the Michigan game week three. All right. So uh, that game, you can catch it at 3.30 on Fox Sports 1. In the 7.30 slot on ABC, this is the game of the week. The number three Ohio State Buckeyes head in Happy Valley, take on the number 18 Penn State Nittany Lions. Ohio State coming off of a game, you know, against Nebraska. Didn't look great in the first half, but came out in the second half and looked incredible. Penn State coming off of an upset loss to the Indiana Hoosiers. Can Penn State bounce back at home in their biggest game of the season, the biggest challenge, what should have been the whiteout, but there's not going to be a fan in the building. Can Penn State get it done? I think the answer is no. Yeah. Um, do we want to go uh, back into the history of Ohio State, Penn State, or do, or do we want to give our previews first? What Let's crank thinking? it back a couple of years, and uh, I'll let you tell the story. All right. Um, so, no, I'll turn it over to you in a second, but 2017 – Ohio State, Penn State. Penn State is the number two team in the country. Ohio State's number six. Uh, Penn State's undefeated. Uh, I believe Ohio State had a loss. Uh, I think the, the loss was to Oklahoma earlier in the year. It was. But the previous season was Penn State's famous or infamous, depending on which side you look at it from. It was their block kick win at the whiteout at Happy Valley. Um, so really high expectations going into this game. Ohio State's down early. They're looking bad. Near the end of the first quarter, Nar, tell them what you did. Well, yeah, I w see, I came on here to take my medicine, so I'm here like a big boy, and I did walk out of the stadium, um, but it doesn't make me a lesser fan. It just makes me a fan who maybe wanted to go have a beer and have a bathroom where he didn't have to wait in line 20 minutes. So we went down 18, so it was 14-3. Um, Paris Campbell had already fumbled. Uh, Damon Arnett had already gotten a pass interference like he usually got before his senior year uh, on a third and long uh, where they went in for a touchdown on the next play or on one of the, on the next series. Uh, the opening kickoff was run back for a touchdown and it was 14, three Penn state and Barkley got his, I think it was probably his, like his last positive yards of the day, because after this run, they completely shut him down. Barkley bounces it outside, goes in from about 45 yards out, and I briskly just walk out of the stadium. I said, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> my, uh, my dad was there. I uh, probably was – there was Reed with his, his dad, who was my college friend. And, um, you know, I get a little bit excited at games too, and I like to say what I want. I like to speak freely. I like to say certain words that I won't say here. And <laughs> I just felt like I needed to maybe be at a place, like a bar – 
where I could say those things and get away with them and I could have drinks. And I had, my sister was there who I hadn't seen that much. She had a bunch of friends in town and they were up at Wild Wings. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna dart towards Wild Wings and uh, taking this game from there. So it wasn't really me giving up. Uh, it was me being a little disgusted and choosing to take the game in a different place. By the time I got up there, Ohio State was coming back, and um, I did tell a guy there that I was just talking to. I call him in as a witness, but I have no idea who he is, just some guy I was talking up at the bar. But I told him, I said, you know, we're going to come back and win this game, right? He goes, yeah, I feel good about it. So I think we were down 11 at that point, one and a half time. But, yeah, I have to take it from Reed and um, everybody. And Andy, uh, Reed's dad, uh, gets on me every once in a while about that. And he says, how could you leave? And I said, I don't know. I just left. It, was, it actually ends up being one of the – my best memories of an Ohio State game just because of, you know, the Wild Wings was crazy. I was there with my sister and three of her friends, and we were just running around the place like nuts. My dad ended up coming up and seeing the end of the game up there. And he gave up in the second half. He followed me, you know, uh, on a fumble. But, yeah, I did. I left the game early and uh, told these guys to see you later so I could go cuss and drink beer and take a pee without having to wait 20 minutes to get back in the stadium. Yeah, I remember, uh, I believe it was right at the end of the third quarter when Old Nar, if you will, left the game. And it was actually right before Ohio State's uh, blocked punt, which really turned the tide of the game. Yeah, uh, I, and I do remember after this game ended, my dad, I believe he texted you a picture of your empty seat <laughs> with some funny comment going along with it. But uh, yeah, so Nar, I will give it to you. You're still a true fan. Obviously, uh, years of supporting this team isn't going to be thrown away by uh, one game and it's got to take some real dedication to be in Sweden watching these games, huh? I, I appreciate your graciousness and uh, not giving it to me too bad. Yeah. I, uh, I actually wake up in the middle of the night to watch these games. Uh, the ones that are prime time. I love the noon games now. And when Fox started pinning, uh, you know, their game of the week as their noon game, because they want that noon time slot. Uh, there have been more big games at noon than, uh, than in the past. So I love the noon games because I get a 6 p.m. kickoff uh, over here. And it's we're five hours ahead this week because we uh, they like darkness over here. So getting dark at 4.30 isn't enough. Let's get it dark at 3.30 in, uh, in the, at the end of October. So we're actually five hours ahead of you now. But uh, not only will I wake up for the Penn State game, but I will wake up for the Rutgers game next week, which uh, they uh, uh, unfortunately assigned at 7.30 because the Big Ten got that slot next week. So, yeah, I do follow them. Um, I don't do social media, but I do do 11 Warriors. I'm on there religiously. Um, I study Ohio State football. I kind of live it, breathe it. So, yeah, it's just uh, I've been known to leave the stadium, though, before. It was interesting. You said your, your dad texted me that uh, picture of the empty seats. He did. I had another friend who texted me after the game. He said, he said, please tell me that you didn't go to the bar at halftime. I said, no, I didn't. I went to the bar in the second quarter. <laughs> 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 so anyway, yeah, I, I caught heck from a couple of people on that. So, yeah. So that's my story. All right. <laughs> and uh, before this 2017 game, any Ohio State, Penn State memories uh, to share for this preview? I've got a few, if I might, um, took notes on a few. I, I have been to Happy Valley twice. So I think both these games might have been before you guys were alive, um, at least one of them. Um, the two games I saw in Happy Valley, they were both pretty interesting games. Uh, Penn State won one and Ohio State won one. Um, 1997, um, Penn State 31, Ohio State 27. It was a tale of two stories for the offenses. Ohio State threw for 459 yards. Most of it was Joe Germain, um, they had David Boston, D. Miller. Um, I want to say Kenyon Rambo was maybe on that team. Um, but we were just thrown all over the place and they ran all over us. Um, Curtis Enos uh, had over 200 yards. Aaron Harris had about 100 yards. Penn State had 324 yards rushing. So it was a um, it was kind of a barn burner. One team throwing the ball, one team running the ball. And that was 97. Uh, the other game was 2003. Ohio State was seven and one. Penn State had some really down years that a lot of people forget about, but they were two and six going into that game. Uh, it was a tight game. Ohio State won 21 20. A guy by the name of Dave Abel lined up for a 60 yard field goal that ended up being about a yard short of the crossbar. Uh, and I saw that game with my boss at the time. But um, two games I've seen in Happy Valley. So just for the, uh, the game in Happy Valley this week, those memories. The two big moments I think that I remember in the last 20 years or so, 
2002, Chris Gamble's pick six in the third quarter was our only touchdown of the game. And he kind of, if you've ever seen the replay, he kind of bobbed and weaved to get in. It wasn't a direct, like he picks it off on the sidelines and goes in. It was a heck of a run in. And then uh, the Troy Smith, where he did kind of a pirouette in the backfield and he escaped the pocket and he heaved the ball to Rubisky in 2006 for about a 55, 60 yard pass was, uh, was incredible. Those are my two big memories, two big plays that I remember from the last 20 years. Awesome. And uh, I meant to ask you this earlier, but back to 2017, at what point uh, in the game did you start to believe Ohio State was going to win? Uh, I think when I got to the bar, because I was like, I told the guy at halftime we were going to win. And it was just, uh, it was a different energy. And um, I thought we were going to win going into the halftime. You could just tell. And you could wow. tell that if we just got the ball enough, we were going to, we were going to win the game. We were moving the ball. I believe we were the better team, the better team going in. I think I started to believe once we blocked the punt, I wasn't as confident at the half. I thought there was hope, but uh, once we blocked that punt is when I really thought that it was going to happen and it was going to be an incredible comeback. But I had a few beers game. Now, I had a few beers and I had some confidence. In <laughs> <laughs> All right. But now Patrick, uh, you can take it away and let's go into this year's game in happy Valley. So 2020, uh, Ohio state's gotta be, you know, kind of, you know, not having fans this season kind of sucks, but if there's any reason for Ohio state to be glad that there's no fans, it's gotta be for this game right here because there's, there's nothing like playing in the white out Ohio state gets it every other year. They didn't get it this year. They dodged it. And I think they dodged a bullet. Not that it would make a difference between win and loss for them this year. I think, I think Ohio state is just a much better team, at least judging by last week. Uh, you know, not that Penn state played bad against IU, but what they did do is choke and they did not hold on and they blew it in the fourth quarter. So even if they're hanging with Ohio state, let's say that it's a touchdown game one way or the other in the second half, Penn State's not holding on to that game. They are going to let it go. They let it go against Indiana in the last two minutes. They let it go against Indiana in overtime. They're not hanging on against Ohio State. And with no fans there to kind of, you know, be the 12th man and will them to victory, I think Ohio State's going to have this one in the bag, 31 to 14. Yeah, I would, I'm going to go ahead and say Ohio State wins this game for three reasons. The O-line, the secondary, and James Franklin. The offensive line – uh, right away, one of the biggest problems for Indiana in their win against Penn State was Shaka Tony and the Penn State D-line. He was Shaka Tony individually, but especially this D-line as a whole. Gave them problems throughout the game, but especially late um, when Indiana had their drive. It looked like it was going to be the two-minute drill where they came back and potentially won it. And uh, Penn State ended up forcing a third and 20-something and then a uh, fourth and really long. Fourth so, and 21. Yeah, it was fourth and 21. So – with Ohio State, who their offensive line didn't look great in the beginning, um, they still have Wyatt Davis, Thayer Mumford, Nicholas Petit Frere, and this is gonna, this is one of the most productive offensive lines in the FBS. So the Penn State pass rush is still going to be there; it's still going to be a factor. But um, Justin Fields is going to be way more protected this game than Michael Penix was last week, and I think the D line, which is one of Penn State's strongest units, is not going to be as much of a factor in this game when you face such a good offensive line in Ohio state, I think Justin Fields is going to have time to work with. He's going to be able to hit his receivers of which he has many high quality receivers. Um, so giving Justin Fields time and eliminating the defensive line is going to be huge for Ohio state. The secondary, even though they lost Okuda and Arnett, this Ohio state group of DBs is built to replace itself as it does year in year out. We didn't see much of this group against Nebraska because Nebraska plays a much more run oriented offense, but I think, Sean Clifford is another one of Penn State's best players. This secondary, I think, is going to limit him as they do against so many quarterbacks. And you take away the D-line and their star quarterback, and Penn State, although, I mean, they're an elite team. they got great players everywhere. You take away some of their best uh, threats, and what are they left with, you know? So I think this secondary, if they play well, which I do believe they will, they should, they're the Ohio State um, secondary, I think BIA will get it done there. And James Franklin. He did it in 2017. He did it in 2018. He did it last Saturday. I don't think this game's going to come down to the last drive or the last two drives, but if it does, Ohio State can always count on their MVP, James Franklin. Penn State always seems to find a way to give games away under Coach Franklin, and if given the opportunity on Saturday, I'm confident he'll, he's going to do it again. I got Ohio State 31-21 in a good game that doesn't come down to the wire, but it is going to be decided in the fourth quarter. 
Yeah, I've got uh, Franklin's game management is questionable, and um, it, it's it's fine for me, especially when we're playing them. But uh, yeah, it, it just doesn't happen in Ohio State games. It's other games, like you saw uh, last week and other times. Um, to me, I, I've done a little bit of analysis here, and I do study Ohio State a bit, but um, when Penn State's on offense, um, Ohio State last week had some assignment and containment issues. Um, it, it was obvious. Um, the defense looked a little lost for a while. Uh, that outside edge wasn't contained. Um, you know, you've got to think that missing the film work hurt them a little bit. You know, you watch film for two reasons. Number one, you watch yourself so you can correct the things that you've done. Uh, number two, you see what your opponents are going to do and what their tendencies are. So, no game film last week. Uh, Frost threw a wrinkle at them, and you know they had some trouble when uh, McCaffrey was putting that deep eye. Uh, they struggled with assignments and containment last week. I think they'll get that figured out. Can Penn State run the ball? Top two running backs are out. You got Devin Ford in there. How do they establish a running game? Um, the QB run has been big for them. Um, you saw a couple years ago, McSorley in 2018 had 175 yards rushing. That's a lot of yards for a quarterback, and it was. Primarily when we were running man, man scheme, you know, the guys are in man to man, they turn and go downfield with receivers, they turn their backs and the quarterback just takes off and he did it the whole game. Uh, when Halfley came in last year, and with Madison and Combs this year they're mixing in more zone. So this way the defensive backs are keeping their eyes into the backfield and can see the quarterback when he takes off. Clifford did run the ball last week. He ran the ball 17 times for 119 yards last week. So you can bet they're going to try to establish the quarterback run. Um, we'll see, you know, we'll see how Ohio State defends that. That's key. Uh, the other key is how does Ohio State get pressure on him without Chase Young? Chase Young had three sacks in this game last year. Uh, when Clifford gets pressure, even when he doesn't get pressure, he makes mistakes. He threw two really key interceptions early last week that really hurt his team against Indiana. Um, when OSU's on offense, the whiteout you guys talked about, I think is huge. Urban Meyer said this week that he feels the whiteout was worth seven to 10 points for Penn State. Um, and it was, it's was it been proven over the years. You've seen better, more talented Ohio State teams come in and play really, really tight games. Um, and uh, 2016, I, think they had a, I thought they had a better team and uh, they lost that game. So the running game last week for Ohio State last week was we really didn't find a bell cow for a running back last week. And Fields probably ran the ball more than we wanted, ran the ball 15 times. Um, you know, I thought it was the offensive line at first. And after watching a little bit, uh, doing a little bit of analysis, uh, Nebraska run blitzed a lot. They sold out on the run. Uh, they put eight in the box. They brought linebackers up in the gaps. Uh, so it wasn't really the. Uh, offensive line it was just more manpower than they could handle and they were really selling out to stop the run um ohio state established the run early last year if you look in 2019 our first drive was uh, uh dobbins carried the ball all the way down the field except for one incomplete pass every yard we gained was on 12 rushes and penn state had one of the better rushing defenses in the big 10 and i think ryan day pulls out his alpha male and says i'm going to shut it down your throats uh and you gotta love it at the end of the day I think, is Sean Clifford good enough to beat Ohio State? And I think the answer is no. I've got Ohio State 41, Penn State 24. Yeah, and uh, you were talking about Justin Fields running the ball. And although as Ohio State, you don't want to risk him getting injured. You don't want him running the ball too much. Um, and he is an incredible passing quarterback. Um, this entire offseason, he's worked on getting leaner, getting faster, getting slimmer. And a lot of that is going in is, is for the purpose of games like this against Penn State. So I think um, if Fields can be a part of this – running game which I really think he will be that's going to be huge for Ohio State and I think at the running back position part of the problem uh, and the reason Ohio State couldn't establish a super dominant run game was partly because of Nebraska's defense but also because it seemed like they didn't know where and when to utilize each running back uh, I believe I said this in our last episode but Master Teague he seems like more of the guy you want in short yard situations he's a powerful back and they were running him on second and, tw and second and 15 plays which doesn't make a lot of sense if you're going to run the ball there you want Trey Sermon or Steel Chambers to be doing that. Um, so I think if they utilize the running backs the right way, it'll work well for them. And Ohio State, they are a team who learns from their mistakes well. They make really good adjustments. This coaching staff, uh, it's one of the best in the country. Uh, it is for a reason. And I think some of the issues we've seen on defense last year, they're going to find a way to fix it like they always do, especially going into a game as big as Penn State. 
Um, and I don't think they're going to have too much trouble going up against Penn State like you too. And one thing on Penn State side is last year, Sean Clifford had an injury going into the game. He re-aggravated it. He had to go out in the second half. Will Levis came in and had a much better performance than Clifford did. And I'm curious as to if Levis is going to make an appearance this game. Um, you'd think they would go with their starting man, Clifford, the entire time. But Levis is more of a running quarterback. And since Penn State's had some success in the past, they might throw Levis in for a drive or two, see how he does. Uh, although last week he did fumble it on, I believe, his only play of the game. Mm-hmm. That's going to be something to look out in for. In the red zone, week. too, against IU. Levis fumbled the ball in his uh, only appearance. And, you know, the thing is with Penn State, you know, you talk about the running game, you talk about Levis. I don't think you're going to have to see much Levis running because Clifford was Penn State's best runner last week. Devin Ford, uh, he scored the touchdown that shouldn't have been, uh, the touchdown that gave Indiana a chance to win the game. Uh, so, honestly, with him, there's going to be a pretty big mental block there. I mean – he cost him the game last week. He and James Franklin's clock management, you know, him not kneeling on the one yard line kind of cost him the game. Plus the defense absolutely folding in on themselves, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, and the thing is, no Kane's out this week. Journey Brown's out this week. Devin Ford's going to be the running back. You're going to see a lot of Sean Clifford runs. Uh, and if that, and if Sean Clifford is not getting it done with his legs then maybe you'll see Will Levis, who knows, but I don't know how reliable Devin Ford is because even if you ignore his touchdown that he shouldn't have scored, he didn't look great against Indiana. IU did a great job of stopping the run. Aside from Clifford, who ran all over them. Yeah, yeah and then right. another thing I forgot to mention too was they they uh, and we should mention this because Pat Fryermuth is a great player. Um, last year, Ohio State put Pete Werner on him, and <laughs> Pete Werner played as. The and he played great in pass coverage. He held uh, Fryermuth to six catches for 40 yards last year, and he allowed Ohio State to play in a single high safety, which which Fuller played. Um, we could see they've switched positions now with Baron Browning. So Werner is now playing the Will, and the Sam is now um, Browning. So it's either going to be Browning on Fryermuth, or like they did last week a little bit, you might see Proctor come in who normally plays safety in as the Sam to cover the tight end, especially on passing down. So it'll be interesting to see how Ohio State chooses to cover Friar Muth with having the success that they did last year. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um... Yeah, so uh, I think we're all unanimous here though. Ohio State's gonna get it done against a Penn State team that while they kind of looked good last week, didn't get it done. And when it's said and done, you got to have that killer instinct to be able to finish a game. They didn't have it last week. I don't think it's going to show up magically this week against a much better Ohio State team. Yeah. And uh, one last thing I forgot to point out last week, Penn State could not kick field goals. And I think that's going to impact them because either they miss field goals this week or it's a fourth and five or so um, in spotty field goal range. They might have to go for it. Ohio State uh, in the past has had good short yardage defense so that could really hurt Penn State throughout this game if either they don't kick field goals or they kick them and miss them so as sort of minor of of an aspect of the game as that normally is that could become a big problem for James Franklin and the Nittany Lions right and Nar mentioned the 60 yarder that was one yard short for Penn State uh, all those years ago last week 57 yarder to win the game for Penn State would have been good from 56 no good Indiana sends the game into overtime and wins it so, yeah, we could see kicking come up, you know, missed a couple of easy kicks, too. They doinked the one right at halftime off the crossbar from, like, the eight-yard line or something. So, kicking, well, it's usually not an issue for Penn State, is an issue this year. So, uh, we'll have to see with that. So, uh, before we stop, though, any other thoughts on this game or previous Ohio State-Penn State games before we go? I'm just hoping for another James Franklin masterclass. Um, like we said in the past, he's been a genius when it comes to blowing games, and um, hopefully he'll get it done again if he has to. Take game hopefully James. we won't need him to, but uh, if, it, if it does come down to that, I'm confident that Ohio State will find a way. <laughs> hey, I've, I've got kind of a question to ponder if we have a few minutes. I mean, there's no sure. whiteout, um, but are they? Are, didn't it sound like to you, Reed, last week that they were piping no, like crowd noise into the stadium to simulate like a, the buzz of a crowd? Last there were two week. things. Yeah, there was some virtual crowd noise, and there were parents in the crowd, too. Okay. I, I know the parents were there, but they weren't there to make enough of that buzz. It seemed like oh, they no. were making yeah. 
and there's got to be some limitations that, you know, a decibel level or some sort of level that they regulate that they can't just blast the speakers. Um, but there, there is sort of a crowd noise, and they've done this with a lot of the soccer games in Europe, too, where they've done that to simulate a crowd noise. So pretty interesting and interesting to see how they do it. But it'll never, uh, it will pale in comparison to a real um, whiteout, which I'm glad we don't have to go into. And it seems like Ohio State gets scheduled. You know, like, I don't want to cry like Nebraska fans, but it seems like we always get a night game at Penn State. Always. <laughs> yeah. And um, Okay. Uh, wait. I looked it up. The Big Ten decibel level for virtual crowd noise is 70, which is equivalent to a vacuum cleaner or washing machine. That's not bad. Yeah. No, 70 is not too bad. So. Yeah, that is – yeah, that will have an extremely minimal impact. And even if it was really, louder – it's just, it's just there they're... to, like, serve that little thing. I in feel your brain like it's like, where's game. the crowd noise? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's I mean, be I, weird for these guys, right? It's got to be strange for them not to play yeah. in front of the crowd. I don't know. They do it in practice, but just especially the, for the kicking, I think. Game. I think. And I mean, even if the decibel level was higher, I think it still wouldn't have as big of an impact as uh, if if they made an artificial decibel level as high as a regular whiteout crowd. I still think it wouldn't be the same thing because it just I would have to imagine feel more personal when there's actual hundred thousand human beings who are yelling at you as opposed to speakers placed throughout the stadium. Yeah. Can you even get speakers to sound that loud? Uh, or would it blow I mean, them out? Who knows? You yeah, have enough probably. speakers, sure. Yeah, you got, yeah, that's <laughs> tough. Have to be some pretty damn big speakers. Mm-hmm. And they'd do it for the competitive advantage. Can't, can't say they wouldn't. Yeah. All right, but if that's all we got today, uh, thank you guys for joining me. Nar, thanks for coming in all the way from Sweden today. Really hey, appreciate uh, it. I, thank you guys for having me. I'm glad to come on and, and take my medicine. So <laughs> it was a lot of fun, and uh, I'm sure you'll be up at what? What time is the kickoff for you over in Sweden for uh, one one thirty a.m. So yeah, I'll tell you my routine. AM. I take a I take a nap like the three thirty games. I don't catch much of those. I'll take a nap from probably about you know. 10 30 to 1 30 you get three hours in i watch the game um and then i i get another nap in from about you know from about uh 5 30 to 7 30 so yeah i take two little naps and the game comes in between so <laughs> i like that planning i like that i remember uh two years ago or really a year ago a year and a half ago i was in france for march madness and i remember uh trying to get up to watch ohio state versus iowa state in the first round, I got up for the last two minutes. I meant to set my alarm, but I accidentally set it an, an hour too late. So I missed the majority <laughs> of that game, but it turned out to be a win. So uh, turned out well enough in the end. I caught the, uh, the 2015 NBA finals, the final game between the Cavaliers and the Warriors in Italy in the middle of the night on Italian television. With Italian That's announcers? Italian announcers. That must have been it because there's always – four announcers always – are way more energetic than the English ones. Yeah, it was fun. It's been five years since then. Crazy. Time flies. All right. Well, thank you, Nar, so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. I told Reed um, I'll come back and, uh, and, and cry about the 90s with Ohio State and Michigan that Reed's dad and I had to go through. So I can, I mean, I can do a whole segment on the nineties and the Cooper years. It, it's, I, I think maybe your demographic needs some appreciation because we've been beating their ass for 20 years now. And there were years that that didn't happen. I mean, we had undefeated national championship teams ruined it seemed like three or four times in the night. I mean, I can go through the nineties, like I, it could be a whole segment. So if you guys want to do it, I can come in and give some of your younger demographic an appreciation for when, uh, for when Michigan just used to make us puke. We would love that. <laughs> Lucky for you, it's not like that anymore. Thank, thank goodness, but I still remember it, believe me. So I still appreciate everyone over there. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for having or for joining us today. Have a good one. Thanks, guys. All right. That'll do it for our show. We'll see you next time. Bye.